The moral of the story really is if you're researching an idea is to evaluate the market and potential rivals really carefully to be intrinsic in your evaluations and analysis and see if there are any titles similar titles that have failed because if they have you want to know why it's really really important because if you don't find out why your idea could crash and burn very quickly and if you were doing this for real and I've helped graduates actually launch a magazine in my previous role at Solent they actually did go on to launch their magazine concept you're actually investing money if it's not your own money it's somebody else's to make the launch happen so you have to be really really careful because if someone gave you ten thousand pounds as a startup you're thinking what a lot of money actually in magazines doesn't go very far you would be accountable to that investor and you'd have to account for if it crashed and burned why it crashed and burned but if you've done your homework it shouldn't have done so this is where I developed what I call a brand I it's a way of plotting your magazine against all the closest rivals here I started with a new uh, writing student magazine against high-end weekly high-end monthly tabloid monthly quarterly and tabloid weekly so here are the closest rivals we have writing magazine an app writers forum an app moving further away the new writer and the self-publishing magazine unfortunately the latter is since crash and burn had just become a digital here we have mislexia which is a high-end magazine now it's funded by the northern arts council so it's very secure and very sustainable the literary review have been going for ages Good housekeeping has in the last few years come into the um, writing market with their annual novel competition and featuring um, writers regularly. L Talent competition and also Wanderlust has a travel writing competition. And High End Weekly Stylist, although it's a free magazine, it's still quite a high end quality in terms of journalism content. It also launched a writing competition. So you can see here that where well, let me, let me throw it to the room because I don't always, I like to be more interactive for my lectures. Who can tell me where they need to invest the most time on analysis of the potential rivals for your new magazine here? You're starting up this one. Where might you look closely? Which titles would you look more closely at, do you think? Anybody? Because as a student magazine, they probably would be looking at being too high end straight from the start. Good. But also, think more logically. Remember what I said when you're plotting the brand I, you do the nearest, the closest to your title here. So you will be looking at literary review, because there would be some elements that you could take from that. You'd look at mislexia because there's feminist writers among students also it's a grant based publication and there may be some opportunity for you to get funding and also in the tabloid monthly quarterly the key rivals writing magazine and writers forum would be probably your closest rivals that don't always cater for the younger writer I don't know if any of you actually do have writing magazine do you take writing magazine or look at writing magazine my point exactly because it doesn't really reach out to you so you would carry an in-depth analysis of your closest competitors but you would also undertake audience survey so you would find your potential audience and you would kind of survey them you would get to know them on facebook you would get to know them through maybe instagram and you would try and get some focus groups as well because being a student magazine you'd have a, a big um, a campus to, to help you with that and also linking with other students social media allows you to link with other students across the country interested in writing 
to really get to know them and understand what they would want from your magazine. What is that they feel is missing from the market? Because that's really important. If you can find what your readers, potential readers need and want, that's half the battle. Because if you think about it, they're going to be paying probably about four pounds per issue to buy your magazine. Now, what would make you pay four pounds an issue? You're not just going to pay out four pounds when you go to the supermarket, are you? Because that's going to really ramp up your food bill very quickly. It's a lot of money now, especially for students. So you have to give them value and a reason for buying the magazine. So in the start of a launch, any new concept development, you have to always say, why should they buy it? Not why shouldn't they, but why should they buy it? Okay, I believe learning from the past, there are many lessons to be learned here, particularly in magazine publishing, and I've used one example that you will find in my second book in the first chapter called Lessons from the Past, was The Ladies' Mercury, which is the first woman's magazine, and this was, I, I couldn't quite believe it, you know, when I first did my research on The Ladies' Mercury, it's, it's, it, it did make me smile. So first of all, we have to consider the background of the launch. It was launched in, in the 1690s when the literary rates were, yes, 40% of males were literate, in other words, could read and write, and only 25% of females, which is the majority of this room, could read and write. That's quite shocking to you, I should imagine. Education wasn't big in that era. It was for the very um, privileged few. So when they actually launched it, John Dunton, the publisher, he launched this magazine, The Ladies Mercury, on the 27th of Feb, 1693 citing it, love as a key editorial pillar. Now you're thinking, oh great, fantastic, love, yeah, we, we're interested in that, everyone's interested in that. Clearly, not so much, because just a few weeks later, on the 17th of March, the last edition was published. <laughs> now, why was that? It was a forward-thinking magazine, and in this t era, and even maybe uh, 150 years later, it would have worked, so why not now? Well, first of all, it was published by a man in an age of extreme inequality. So it's a male-dominated world. Even as far back as the 50s, you needed your husband or father's permission to have a bank account. And ladies certainly didn't buy houses or, or run their own finances. It was a very, very rare thing. So all the, gen the, the power and the wealth was male-orientated in those days. Also, it was likely that Dunton, and I'm, I'm allowing a bit of uh, creative license here and, and summation, but Dunton may not have had a clear understanding of his female audiences because how many of you have watched Pride and Prejudice, for example, or Emma or something like that? Yeah. So in those days, the men after dinner went for their cigars or, and brandy and the ladies sat daintily playing cards. Very rarely would they interact. It's certainly you know, a world away from even 100 years ago. So you could argue that it was highly unlikely that as a man, John Dunton would really understand his female audience at that era because he just didn't have that depth of knowledge of what, who his female readers were. And obviously we, don't, we didn't have the resources then to test the idea before he launched it, he just launched it. Hence, it very quickly crashed and burned. But by the same time, this is why I'm saying it's a lesson in timing, really. Had he have launched this two or three hundred years later, do you think it might have worked? And if so, why? Anybody? Good. Yes, exactly so. And even today, I find I would find it very difficult that if you published a magazine aimed at, at women, if it was published by a man, if the man was the editor, I would think it would be quite difficult to make that work. Because, and I'm looking around for a, a young lad in the audience, and um, I'm going to say, there isn't one to really ask, but I don't think 
that the editor, an editor who doesn't have specialist knowledge of his audience or her audience, can make a magazine work for that or an audience they don't know about. For example, years ago I worked with on a launch of a vegetarian magazine and the editor wasn't a vegetarian. So it was very much half in, half out. And it didn't become stronger until they changed the editor who was a vegetarian. Because they didn't really understand the audience in that particular concept. If you had someone who went, say, from take a break to managing to editing a writing magazine, probably not going to work because although they're a journalist, they if they don't have that interest in writers and they're not into writing fiction in their spare time or or writing uh, non-fiction, they're not going to have that passion. To make a magazine work, a concept work, you need good timing, you need an editor and publisher who are passionate about the subject, and an editor who is going to love the magazine and have a strong personality to develop that magazine into something quite unique. You think of the magazines that you buy. How many of you buy a magazine a month or more? One magazine a month or more? Oh. Sorry? Yes. Yes, of course. Prime or or Readly or Access a magazine, shall we say, digital. Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. But you have to think about it. What would make you buy a magazine? So think about it from the other perspective. So the, va the magazine then becomes a value proposition. Can anyone tell me what a value proposition is? Have a guess. Let's hear something from this side of the audience who are perhaps a little quieter, but I'm sure have a lot to say. Have a guess. Just doesn't matter if you might be wrong. What's the proposition? Put the two together. I'll go back to this side of the room then. Okay, so value and proposition. It means that you have a product that is valuable and anything you sell has to be having intrinsic value to your market. Okay, so that's what value proposition means. So whether it's a new launch or even relaunching a title, publishers must set up an overview of their basic proposition because they will need to get funding. So you would first need to define the market sector. Okay, where will the publication fit? Will it be consumer, lifestyle sector, specialist, B2B, local or contract? Now contract is customer publishing, of course, which is the likes of Sky Producer Magazine, um, Virgin Producer Magazine, Wait Rose, Tesco's, Marks and Spencer's, that sort of thing. They produce magazines for customers only, so they don't need to make so much of a profit, but that's a different story. Category. If it's a consumer magazine, be clear on the category. Is it lifestyle, health and beauty, fashion, fitness, food? You must have a very clear category, it's really important. Target audience, who are they and how will you find them? And this is really important. If you're doing a relaunch, it means that your audience, um, your circulation's dropped off dramatically and you need to now widen participation and find a wider audience. Publishing format. Print and digital or just digital? Very, very important. I think from a professional perspective that anyone thinking of launching a magazine should always provide a digital edition. But if you are producing a print edition, it's important that you give your subscribers access to print as well. Give people the choice of where and how they consume the product. Because, for example, you might be having a glass of wine on a Friday night in front of the TV before you go out and you will be want to flick through a magazine. You've been on screen all day, you don't want to look at your tablet, you've had enough of that, but you want to flick through the magazine, you want to smell the magazine. It's a funny thing, but us magazine buffs like to smell our magazines, I know. And you love the pictures, the quality of the magazine, the feel, the look, the layout. So always with publishing, give people a choice of the format, I would say. And I think that's going to become easier 
as we move, progress with technology, print on demand will be much easier in five years than it is today. It's even much easier than it was 10 years when people were self publishing no um, novels. Also, think about the issue frequency. Are you going to produce a quarterly magazine, monthly, or weekly? Now, in recent times, O'Cumley and Love magazine, quarterly magazines, and Monocule, for example, they charge a, l a high cover price for their, their quarterly editions. But they get them because they are so beautifully produced and there's so much content and people like um, to take their time over them. Okay, a unique identity is really about branding. So branding kind of says to the reader, I'm going to get the same quality across all of aspects of this magazine. You know, whether it's the um, the print and digital edition, whether it's a website, whether it's a live event, whether it's a publication, you know, a, a biannual publication or, or spin-off publication, no matter what, I will get the same quality. And a good idea thing about branding is, as you can see, Writer's Digest, it's really got the branding right. You'll be able to identify that magazine if you took the um, Moss head off, in other words, the name of the magazine. You probably would still say it was writing uh, Writer's Digest magazine because it has a very powerful um, brand identity and a similar style. So the key is with brand identities and covers, each edition should look the same but different in terms of covers, if that makes sense. So its branding is also reflected in a magazine's core values and ethics. For example, again, I'll give you an example of Vegetarian magazine wanted to run an interview with Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. Now, why do you know Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, River Cottage fame? Uh, some of the older ones of us do. Well, he was he got famous from ha having this little television series about a, a, a small holding farm he set up in Dorset and of course he slaughtered animals to eat them etc etc so he was providing a food chain so you can see why he suddenly I think he had a, a meat free month or something he was doing something he they suddenly decided to um, interview him at Vegetarian Living why was that problematic in terms of the magazine's ethics and core values what would readers have thought about that Controversial in the sense that it's meat lovers versus vegetarians if they're so siloed. Ve vegetarians, you know, uh, usually they give up. It's, they give up meat because of ethical concerns about how you know how meat um, is produced, etc., and and the process involved. So it didn't go down very well, and of course the circulation started to dip a little bit because readers lost faith in the brand's core values and ethics. Trust was lost to a degree, and trust is incredibly important when you are producing a magazine. You, you, you're producing editorial, people have to trust what you're, they're reading. They have to trust your magazine to aspire to the values they set out at the start. But moving on, also, you have to have a strong USP, and usually if you're smart, it's your brand strap line that you can put on the cover. Covers and the cover price, are they going to be high end or low end or in the middle? Overall design, everything should be style, a house style across the publications, be it print, digital and online. That brand identity you see there has to go into all aspects of the magazine's brand extensions. Advertising or promotional material so advertising from the magazine's perspective not the sales perspective but advertising the magazine to um, various outlets be it um, to b having advertisements in um, reciprocal deals with other magazines or advertising on newsstands advertising it on TV as has been done occasionally the material promotional material must also reflect the style and tone of the brand very very important so what makes a strong brand? It's the concept, it's a promise, it's a benefit. So anything you produce to go to market, be it an, a, um, oh, 
a, a, a new smartphone, okay, um, that has something unique about it to uh, rival Apple, be it a magazine, be it a newspaper, be it a website, it has to have a value, a promise and a benefit to make drive people to that. Otherwise, you won't have an audience. This is reflected by the strong masthead, in this case the magazines, and consistent house style within the magazine. And also the ID, D, identity, that goes across the whole of the provision. Now, these days magazines don't just produce an edition, they produce a whole other stuff as well. They produce apps, they produce a website, they may produce uh, books, future publishing, they produce annual editions and, and bookazines as well, which are quite popular. A lot of the main lifestyle magazines now have events, which of course then always have to reflect the brand, because otherwise if you go to an event and it's something a bit different than you would expect, you're going to be disappointed. And they can't, you cannot disappoint your readers, because if you disappoint your readers, what's going to happen? They lose revenue. Yeah. You lose readers, they go somewhere else. And there's always somewhere else for them to go. So you can never not maximize your brand identity. You can never steer away from that brand identity unless you have a complete relaunch. Very important. Now, which brings me on to the brand identity and how it needs to evolve and generally evolve in the market it is. Because I think a few years ago, publishers started to realize that actually just producing a feature in the magazine, then replicating it online, almost word for word, but maybe a couple of hundred words shorter, is not the way to go. Because why would you buy, why would readers buy a copy of the magazine? They wouldn't, they'd just go online. So it didn't work. So I devised the feature package. So instead of having an angle for your feature, you actually have a theme and then you have individual angles for each part. Okay, so for the print and digital angle, just to be clear on digital, by digital I mean the PDF version which you find on Amazon Prime or Readly. Okay, so for example, we'll take the theme living with dementia. So the print and digital angle might be about getting the right care. The online approach could be a little bit more personal because you've got more creative license with this. You could have a daughter's experience and you could have some built-in added value with a, perhaps an audio clip of a media's, media of a professional on how to spot the early signs of, of dementia and also perhaps a patient, a video clip of a patient in the early stages talking about his or her experiences to date, which becomes a lot more powerful than just having stage one on its own. And then, to make it work full circle, the 360, you then have the signposting stages, because if readers don't know where to find the stuff, it's not going to work as well. So at the print article, you would have, perhaps at the bottom, a signpost to the online and the added value. You would also promote it on Twitter. Now, these days, if I write articles, and I still write, and I write for um, In Publishing Magazine mostly and What's New in Publishing, and they expect me to tweet snippets of the article, a build up to the article and then once it's published, whether it's online or in print, I tweet about it to drive more people to it. And you might want to promote it on Facebook or Instagram. And also there's room as well in the editor's newsletter to also promote it. So you see it goes right round full circle. And the other thing that is really important now is learning how to do infographics in content because nobody likes reading heavy wasted statistics when you can have an infographic that is just going to show something very very simply or a timeline which is going to be a very powerful image which works very well online as well as in print too so really think about when you are writing features and my first my third book talks more about this in depth but when you are writing th features, if you think of them of, as a package, one, the editor's going to like you a lot more, and two, you can charge more for them when you get more experienced. Does that make sense? It's, I think, very important that uh, now, with the um, cohorts coming up and graduating that are being trained in multimedia skills, it's much easier for publishers to be able to produce 
360 degree content. Before they didn't really have the skill sets. Now with you guys coming through, it's quite easy. And technology has also helped because you've all got your phones. Basically, anyone here got an iPhone 11? Most of you, iPhone 10? Eight? Okay, eight's fine. But you're gonna get 10 and 11 in the next year or so, I'm sure. You can produce, you can produce quite good quality video with an iPhone. You know, it doesn't have to be, these videos do not have to be shot as, as our, um, our videographer is doing now. They can be shot on an iPhone and edited. The audio clip can be quite easily done too, with audacity and um, a microphone. It's quite cost effective to produce these video clips. So publishers are realizing that the more added value content you can give with a feature, the more readers will be engaged and will widen participation. That's one of the reasons podcasting is so successful because it widens participation. A few years ago, I, about three years ago now, I interviewed Rob Attar, who is the editor of BBC History magazine, and he told me that they literally doubled their circulation when within a few years of starting their podcast series because it widened participation and promoted interest in the magazine. And you have to think about these things. If you can think about features from an editor or publisher's perspective, you'll be far more successful when you're pitching. Far more successful because at the end of the day, publications need money. If they're paying the feature writer, I don't know, 150 pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, etc., that wad of money there has to be recouped somewhere. And where is it recouped? In the copy sales, because the cover lines sell a magazine. So if you can produce a strong potential cover line when you're pitching to an editor, you're going to get published. Does that make sense? Some of you are looking a little puzzled, that's why I was asking. So always think about the money. You may think, oh, it's a bit boring or sad to think about money, but actually a lot of things revolve about money. And if you can get your head around that, you'll be a more successful journalist and you'll be a more successful publisher. It's not all about money, but money helps. If you can produce a profitable magazine, then you will have sustainability and you will be able to develop that magazine to produce quality editorial. When you look at some of the cheaper magazines that have really crap editorial and a lot of content marketing, they crash and burn quite quickly because the publisher has not invested in paying for quality editorial and it's always a mistake. It may survive in the short term, but long term, more than a year, probably not. People get rise, wise very quickly. Okay, digital is also important. So making digital profitable is a key thing. Give readers easy access to both. Keep your costs low. The biggest problem some of my clients publishers ha have had has been the amount they've had to invest on digital infrastructure when they're producing resource heavy digital editions. In other words, the iPad edition, for example, of 442, where they had all singing or dancing gimmicks in that edition. You could get video, you could get stats. It's very resource heavy to produce that kind of app. Much better to produce a sensible PF PDF adaptation which is basically um, has a few nice gimmicks such as um, buttons on the page but it's quite simple and easy to produce from printing printers perspective because now digital editions a lot of them are either produced by the um, platforms they go such as Amazon Prime or Readly or they're produced by um, the printers printers also produce digital editions as part of the package printing package focus on the content Produce a strong page turner model that can be easily adapted from print to digital when you're starting out. That isn't going to be resource heavy and drain your limited funds because particularly when magazines are starting out, they have very limited funds, unless you're Hearst or Future. The small magazines and the, uh, the main staple of, of the independents start out with a probably in a bedroom with one or two people. It's true, you'd be surprised. Maximize your revenue, okay? So be on platforms such as Readly, if you can. Readly don't take everyone, but if you have a quality product, you've got a good chance. Um, 
enhance advertising streams with across platform packages. So I know you don't know much about advertising sales, but what revolutionized a couple of my clients was an idea I presented to them. Why are you selling digital, um, digital and online adverts separately from the print? Why don't you just package it together and say, okay, this is the exposure you'll get. This is what you'll get for one fixed price. You can charge more, but you'll always know, you know where you're going to be. You're not going to miss out because the print edition, believe it or not, is very valuable in advertising terms because people keep their copies or they pass them on to two or three other friends. So that advert doesn't just disappear from the screen and can't just be clicked on the X to get rid of it. So packages are really key. I've actually written a piece on this for What's New in Publishing and I did create a link to my article because I don't know if you're going to be publishing on their uh, learning resource. So um, I've created a link there and also to Readly too. Building multiple revenue streams is crucial in today's um, cutthroat business because copy sales probably you're not going to make a lot of money through the newsstands. You'll make with luck 50% of the cover price but if you run a big um, campaign promotion campaign in the in the on the newsstands in other words in the supermarkets or in the um, in Smith's or somewhere like that that's going to cost you even more money and eat in to your profit further so you need to think of a way of producing the magazine in a cost-effective manner that's also going to widen participation. A lot of people now are trying to engage in subscriptions. Now subscriptions don't work for everybody because I suspect that you wouldn't buy a lifestyle magazine subscription. But probably if you've got a hobby you're interested in, you might invest the money if it was say a photography magazine or something that was of intrinsic interest to you. So one size doesn't fit all in this model. Advertising packages enable advertisers to reach their audience across print, digital and online and social media provisions by having, as I said, one package can be a very powerful um, selling point to your advertisers, particularly when your rivals aren't doing that. Brand extensions, and these are, you're seeing now that the magazine is now becoming almost a service provision to its readers. You look at particularly the lifestyle magazines and the specialist magazines and even the B2B, they're all a service provision because this supports the magazine so it can produce quality editorial. So events, services, for example, um, in The Economist will have evergreen content or about investments, they'll have um, the a recruitment magazine, for example, focusing for HR professionals will have not only a, a job site, it will have all sorts of other additional services. There will also be in the mainstream books, and of course with writing magazines, they're big on their competitions, self-publishing competition, short story competitions, um, poetry, etc. All of these things can boost uh, cash flow. It's really important that you, when you do your analysis your, um, in the brand eye of potential rivals of the title you plan to do, plan to launch, is that you look at the, the brand extension provision very, very carefully and see what they're doing and work out ways that you can do something better. If you just copy it, it's not going to be suc a successful launch. You have to innovate and think, okay, where do I want the magazine to go? What kind of reader am I going to have and what will best serve that reader? What will make them part with money for this magazine? Because it is an investment in their money, no matter what you say. They are investing to get something back. You don't pay out money needlessly. You always hope to get something back. If it's a chocolate bar, cup of coffee, magazine, um, a notebook, whatever, you're getting something back, right? So you have to think of it in those terms. Okay, I've just noticed the time. <laughs> it's gone very quickly. I've put some resources on there for you. Um, I think also you should be looking at what's new in publishing, in publishing magazine, UK Press Gazette for stories about publishing, and also check out the International Magazine Centre. And also, thank you for listening. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Any questions? How might your magazine 
the industry and readers evolve over the next decade. And I think if you can think ahead, what does the next decade look like to you guys, for example? Anyone? No paper. Do we? Do we see no paper? Do you guys see no paper? Look. This is mixed here. that feels like paper, but it's all on one. I think that really, in some ways, the talk about the costs and the impact really sums up the hard business sense that Mary has just given us in terms both of understanding why you need to think of yourself if you're going to write and be successful, why you need to develop features in the ways that she has suggested so that your editors will want you to write for them. And also, for those of you who hope to be entrepreneurs, how you might too, in the future, start your own successful media business online, in print, or on any other platform. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very important. Think ahead.